Hello, everyone. Welcome to our DBS Business Insight. Today, this is the second time we've invited the International Energy Agency, IEA, to speak to all of you, our customers. As many of you know, the IEA was set up in the 1970s on the back of the oil crisis at that time. So it is only apt that we have IEA speaking to us now when we are facing energy shortage in many of our countries, especially for oil and gas. Today, our two speakers from the IEA are going to speak to you about the net zero emissions scenario. This being a scenario means that it is not a prediction, rather it is a description of the pathway that will get us to become net zero and not to overcome the to overshoot the planetary boundaries above the 1.5 average temperature increase. So with that, I will pass over to Wee Sing, our Head of Energy, Renewables and Infrastructure, to do his opening remarks and introduce our speakers. Um, before I do that, um, I know there is a QR code for our Q&A that you will see now on screen. Let me pause for a few seconds uh, so that you can whip out your mobile phone to scan the QR code. We do encourage all of you to enter your questions during the course of the presentation. All right, let me now pass on to Wee Sing. Thank you, Yolanda. And a very good afternoon to all clients, our speakers from the IEA, and of course, DBS colleagues. Well, welcome to our DBS Business Insights on the topic of Roadmap to Net Zero by 2050. Today's webinar with IEA is the second we had one last month in the series of the knowledge sharing sessions that we've put together for you, our clients and colleagues across multiple industries, including energy, commodities, metals mining, transportation, real estate, just to name a few. We had one last month and with the IEA that some of you have attended where we talked about financing clean energy transitions. And we're very glad to welcome some of you back. Today's webinar will focus on the landmark report that some of you have already seen, the net zero by 2050. The full title will be a roadmap for the global energy sector published by the IEA, which paints the global energy roadmap needed to reverse the current trend toward climate change. Let me start by first introducing our two distinguished speakers uh, from the IEA, Dr. Timo Gul, who is the head of the Energy Technology Policy Division, and Dr. Stephanie Bukat, head of Demand Sectors Unit. Dr. Gul's work focuses on energy, climate change, oil demand, renewable energies, and energy efficiency. He co designed and co directed IEA's report study for net zero by 2050. Prior to his current assignment, he was a lead author of the World Energy Outlook, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, and coordinated energy modeling work related to energy modeling work related to future energy demand. Dr. Stephanie covers various analyses and reports related to energy demand, energy efficiency, and climate. She's the principal co-author of the IEA's report that we're going to talk about today. And prior to her current assignment, she was senior energy analyst responsible for coordinating the analysis and modeling of the end use sectors for IEA's World Energy Outlook as well. Together, they will take us through the report on net zero by 2050 uh, and in the next few minutes. Let me first set the backdrop before I hand it over to our speakers. I recently said in an interview that this decade, will see climate solutions and technology development accelerate. Because I believe that the global momentum behind sustainability, sustainability has clearly moved from the philosophical, if you will, to the practical, from the why to the how. And a case in point would be the recent issuance of an RFP from Singapore's Energy Market Authority for green energy imports of up to 1.2 gigawatt AC into Singapore, and with the second RFP quickly to follow for almost another three gigawatts. Now, our ASEAN had ambitions for an ASEAN power grid for years. These projects are likely to start some serious planning around actual implementation of such a cross-border grid. 
we would need enabling regulations and frameworks that allow cross-border trading of electricity. And not only that, with the increasing requirement for 24-7 green power, all of us will have to hunker down and tackle the cost of storage to facilitate this. Since our last Business Insight series in, on, in October 27th, we have had COP26, we've had refreshed carbon ambitions by countries, we've had the Glasgow Climate Pact, which amongst other things, resolves terms for the implementation of Article 6. This has the potential to provide a platform for the scaling up of carbon markets around the globe. And then because there's now clarity around CDM credits from yesteryears, an agree agreement around mechanisms to avoid double counting of carbon credits uh, when they really transfer. And I believe this is a positive development for CIX, or what we call Climate Impact X, a global voluntary carbon marketplace and exchange that we, DBS, set up with Tomasic, Singapore Stock Exchange, and SCB. Of course, issues remain. Just a few days ago, Indonesia, which is a potential rich source of voluntary carbon credits for global markets, has said it will not allow cross-border carbon trade until it meets its greenhouse gas reductions. However, I'm hopeful that necessity will be the mother of invention and breakthroughs. And that is the reason for this business insight series that we organize. I'm convinced that solutions to these challenges, which are very real, technical or otherwise, they require a whole ecosystem of players, from energy and infra developers, financiers like us, public sector, academia, and the list goes on. Of course, we as a bank are also doing our part as ASEAN embarks on its journey to achieve sustainability, is that its sustainability ambitions. Similar to DBS, we are committed to achieve net zero operational carbon emissions across the bank by, by next year, 2022. And in the lead up to COP26, we announced our, our, our participation in the industry-led net zero banking alliance. As the first Singapore bank to join that, this is a, the NZBA, we call it, is a component of the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero and is hosted by the United Nations Environment Program Financial In Initiative. This reinforces our ongoing efforts to tackle climate change as a responsible participant in this whole journey and furthers the bank's commitment toward realizing a net zero future. As at end last year, 99.9%, uh, .9 as good as 100% of our new suppliers have signed their commitment to the bank's sustainability sourcing principles. Now, the value, the value of knowledge share, I believe, is actually two-way. So I really want to encourage you to prepare your questions, to tap the brains of our very accomplished speakers today via the pigeonhole link that uh, Yolanda shared earlier. And I believe you have had enough of me. Let me now hand the time over to Dr. Timo Gu. Over to you, Dr. Timo. Thank you very much. Uh, we sang, um, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, um, dear colleagues, or good morning, rather, from uh, Paris. Uh, distinguished guests, dear colleagues, it's a great pleasure um, for um, my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Stephanie Bukar, and myself to be here with you today. Um, even if we regret, of course, that we can only be um, with you uh, virtually. We are here with you today to talk a bit about the pathway to net zero emissions from the energy sector by the year 2050, um, drawing on a study that we released on the 18th of May um, to, um, the, um, to the public, but also drawing on the World Energy Outlook that uh, was released in October. So we're trying to are going to try to give you a bit of a sense of our um, view on a path to net zero emissions um, as we have released them in the course of these two publications. Now, those of you who follow us a bit more closely, uh, we have a long history with climate change scenarios, not quite as long as the IA history itself. Um, IA was founded in the 1970s in response to um, the, um, uh, the oil crisis. But um, for the past 15 years or so, um, we have been working in a variety of different contexts on increasingly stringent um, uh, scenarios for addressing climate uh, change. Why increasingly um, uh, uh, stringent? 
um, the science um, some 15, 20 years ago was about, or the global um, way of thinking about reaching climate goals was about uh, reaching um, two degrees, um, which is what our scenarios used to be designed for. Um, in 2015, there was the um, Paris Agreement, with, which for the first time cemented another temperature goal, which was about reaching well below two degrees and pursuing efforts to reach 1.5 degrees. In 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on uh, Climate Change released a landmark report that underscored the sheer significance of reaching 1.5 degrees for us uh, here living um, on uh, the planet and for all um, future generation, which put this more ambitious end of um, temperature goals of the Paris Agreement increasingly um, to um, the fore. It was uh, reflected um, uh, just a couple of weeks ago in um, uh, the Glasgow uh, Climate Pact as well. Since the IPCC report in 2018, we at the IEA have been increasingly looking into scenarios that address the question, how can we reach 1.5 degrees? How can we limit, rather, the global mean temperature rise to uh, 1.5 uh, uh, degrees, which you can equate, more or less, with reaching net zero emissions from the energy sector by the year 2050. In our uh, World Energy Outlook 2019, we, for, for the first time, looked in uh, some detail into what uh, reaching net zero by 2050 might actually be imply. Uh, imply. Uh, in 2020, in our energy technology perspectives and our World Energy uh, Outlook publications, we looked at um, the need for reaching net zero by uh, 2050 through a variety of different lenses as well. And then our executive director, Dr. Fatih Biro, called um, my colleague, Laura Corsi, and myself in his office uh, in September, um, uh, asking us to put together a full roadmap for reaching for the world to reach net zero by um, the year 2050. This report has been remarkably successful, I should say. Uh, it's been uh, uh, used and uh, quoted everywhere around um, the world. Um, as the Time magazine put it um, early in the year, it is the climate report that rocked the energy world. And I think um, this is a very good description of, of what uh, actually happened. The report was designed as an input on request of the UK COP26 uh, presidency as an input to establish a common understanding of what net zero by uh, 2050 would actually mean for the COP26. Uh, which brings me to my last point before I hand over um, to Dr. Bukar, which is about the COP26 um, um, outcome. Now, there is a lot of discussion, of course, um, whether COP26 was uh, a, sex, a success and, uh, or whether it was not. Our view is clearly that this COP26 achieved a lot. Uh, did it achieve everything? Clearly, no. But portraying as a, it as a failure, as you see it in some um, media reporting, is much too strong and, in fact, quite unhelpful. It laid significant groundwork um, to increase momentum for the transformation that is necessary in the global energy sector um, for the years to come. There are three areas um, where uh, significant advances were made in terms of commitments. Think about the impressive targets set by India to reach um, net um, zero um, emissions, or um, think about um, uh, the global methane pledge. Um, the second area is collaboration. Um, without international collaboration, we will not be able to meet our global uh, climate goals, and there were significant such steps from the US-China Joint Declaration, from the Just Energy Transition Partnership with South Africa, um, to uh, various different others. And the third area um, where significant progress was made was on rules. Um, think about um, uh, the Paris uh, rule book that was actually uh, completed, which will allow us new mechanisms to ratchet up ambitions um, over the coming years. Um, where do we go from here? Uh, what is the path needed uh, and the steps needed to reach uh, net zero emissions from the energy sector is subject to our session today. And uh, with that, I would like to give um, the word to, over to uh, Stephanie Bukar, who will talk you through um, some of the key findings before I take up um, the end of the presentation later on. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Joel. So uh, with that, um, I'll start the presentation to, with a bit of overview of uh, 
where we stand in terms of CO2 emissions. So over uh, the last uh, two decades, we have seen global CO2 emissions rising continuously and uh, cumulative emissions since pre-industrial times have warmed Earth by more than one degree already, reaching around 40 gigaton of CO2 in uh, 2020. So looking back at our baseline before the Paris uh, Climate Summit, we saw continued emissions growth out to 2050, and this will have led already to a catastrophic level of warming of around 3.5 degrees by the end of the century. But as you can see on the slide, uh, we now see a very different picture emerging in the energy sector thanks to new policies, technology cost reduction, and also the economic impact of the pandemic. So in the steps, the, the, the blue wedge, which stands for the stated policy scenarios uh, in, in the World Energy Outlook uh, 2021, uh, we take into account all uh, the policies that are implemented, but also all new policies that have been announced as long as they are backed up by specific measures. So in that scenario, we see a near-term peak in global emissions, and after that, a slow decline. But clearly, this is not still not enough, as uh, this would leave us to warming of 2.6 degrees by the end of the century, so quite far from the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. Before uh, the COP in Glasgow, so a lot of countries have announced net zero targets, and around 120 countries have submitted new or updated 2030 NDCs, and these countries account for slightly more than half of global emissions. And with all uh, these new policy ambitions and net zero pledges, we have incorporated them into a new scenario called the announced pledge scenarios, which assume that all these targets are met in full and on time. And for the first time, uh, this will lead us to a substantial change in the emissions pathway compared to the steps, with a peak in the mid 2020s and then a steady decline. Under that scenario, uh, that was published in uh, in 20 uh, in October, so before uh, the Glasgow uh, summit. Um, the, the world will be headed for 2.1 degrees of warming by the end of the century, so also missing the goals of the Paris Agreement. Despite uh, this progress, uh, we are still far from reaching a net zero by 2050. And this is what you can see in, uh, in, the, in this green wedge. Um, and you can see that this gap is particularly important in the short term to 2030. In 2030, the announced pledge closed only 20% of the gap between the stated policy scenario and the NZD scenario, so leaving an ambition gap of some 14 gigaton of CO2 equivalent uh, by 2030. So countries with pledges and those without are each responsible for about half of the remaining gap between the announced pledge scenario and the NZD. So this clearly indicates that all countries need to step up and raise their ambitions if we want to close that gap. But as Dr. Gould said, since uh, the publication of uh, the Rio 2021 and at, during uh, the Glasgow meeting, more countries have been raising their ambitions and we have updated our analysis of these new targets at, made at uh, COP26, including India's targets uh, to reach net zero emissions by 2070, on top of all uh, the targets made previously. And this showed that um, if all these pledges and targets are met in full and on time, they will be enough to hold the rise in global temperatures to 1.8 degrees by the end of the century. And clearly this is a landmark moment because this is the first time that uh, governments have come forward with targets of uh, sufficient ambitions to hold global warming to below uh, 2 degrees. Um, what does that mean now in terms of energy markets? Uh, clearly, this will have implications already in the next uh, decade. If we look at the stated policy scenario, scenario so with the current policy uh, environment, we see that oil demand exceeds soon the 2019 level, so the level that we had already before the pandemic, that natural gas is 15% higher in 2030 compared to today's level, and that after rebounding strongly in 2021, Coal never exceeds pre-pandemic level and starts already to decline, while star PV and wind expansion means that these two sources meet three quarters of electricity demand growth by 2030. Of course, the uh, impact of announced pledge uh, and uh, technology shifts, efficiency improvements, 
and other uh, measures that we take into account uh, in the uh, APS scenario have already important impact in the next decade. So with all of this, we see quite some changes. Oil peaking by 2025, notably due to a reverse of trends of oil use for cars. And this is clearly linked to the more than 30 countries that have announced that they will stop IC sales by a certain date. For natural gas, we see a peak just after 2025, with reductions stemming from the power sector, with renewables increasing their market share, and in buildings, thanks to more efficient buildings and a switch to electricity. While for coal, as you can see, we are, of course, lower than in the step scenario. And in the case of solar PV and wind, they continue their further expansion, meeting all the electricity demand growth by 2030 and having annual capacity additions reaching almost 500 gigawatts by 2030. <clears throat> to sum up, in terms of uh, fossil fuels, the share of fossil fuels in 1990 was 81%. 30 years after, so today, this share has dropped to 79%, so only two percentage points lower. But already in the APS, we will observe an important change as in the next decade, this share will drop to close to 70%. However, this remains still far from what we will need in uh, and what we will observe under net zero pathway, where the share of fossil fuel will reach 60% by 2030. So as you can see, uh, the picture for energy markets here is drastically different in an NZD world. And already by 2030, we see a faster electrification of transport, which will have important impacts on oil demand, a faster decarbonization of the power sector, which will see uh, coal further declining and gas declining in the second half of the decade, and um, meeting the additional uh, demand from further electrification uh, will be met by uh, solar PV and wind, meaning that uh, these two sources will require a quadruple. So the scale of the change required in the energy system in such a scenario are huge, uh, but we still have reason to remain optimistic as the pathway uh, to keep the door to 1.5 degrees open is narrow, but it's achievable. But clearly, it's, uh, it requires important change uh, in the next decade, as uh, you, I will show you now uh, in, in this slide. So I have mentioned um, solar PV and wind. Annual capacity additions of these two sources have quadrupled over the past decade, and they need to quadruple again over the next decade in the NZD scenario. So annual solar PV and wind capacity additions are more than 1,000 gigawatts in 2030. So I mentioned that in the, the case of the APS, uh, they reach almost 500 gigawatts by 2030, so it's twice the amount that we have in the APS. Wind and solar PV provide as much as 40% of electricity generation globally in 2030. Uh, achieving this means that the largest solar park in the world today would need to be built nearly every day in 2030. And just a bit to, to give also a bit of context, just 1% of solar PV and wind output in 2030 will be needed to provide electricity access for all. Another area where we need an important uh, increase and a cre uh, incredible expansion is the case of electric cars. Electric car sales must rise 18-fold from just almost 5% of sales today to about 60% of total sales. By 2035, there are no new sales of uh, internal combustion engines cars globally. So I've mentioned that already more than 30 countries have set up such a target uh, but uh, by a different date sometimes. We know that um, electric car sales in 2020 passed 50% already in Norway and Iceland and are on the rise elsewhere with 25% uh, or more also in Sweden and in the Netherlands. Another important area where we need uh, improvement is energy efficiency. Boosting energy efficiency is absolutely key. This is also important for increasing energy security. Even with rapid growth in low emissions power generation, the safest energy supplies are those that are not needed. And this includes uh, many uh, measures, uh, either in the industry sector, in buildings, uh, for appliances and transport. They need uh, to scale up very quickly. 
So in this scenario, these measures are front-loaded. Uh, for example, 20% of existing buildings globally need uh, to be retrofitted and need to be zero carbon ready uh, by 2030 to make sure that those are uh, zero carbon by 2050. And another uh, important area is boosting uh, the efficiency of cooling equipment, especially in uh, developing economies uh, like India, to make sure uh, that we reduce uh, the uh, electricity demand growth. The energy intensity of the global economy must fall by 4% per year, which is twice uh, the recent rate. So this is uh, clearly an idea of what needs to happen in the next decade, and here we can rely on technologies that exist. But to put us on the pathway uh, towards net zero, uh, we need also important change uh, by 2050. And for those, we don't have uh, yet uh, the technology. So we have all the technologies uh, in the market today to achieve uh, the emissions reductions required to 2030, but this is not especially the case uh, by 2050. Um, we don't have them yet in the market. Many of these technologies are today still at uh, the demonstration or even uh, prototype stage. In 2050, almost 50%, so almost half of CO2 emissions uh, reductions in the NZD come from such uh, technologies that are not yet commercial. So there are many uh, technology options that uh, can help the company in these, these sectors. Um, decarbonizing the industry sector, heavy industry sector, or uh, shipping or aviation sectors, but uh, they typically fall into the categories of uh, electrification, um, CCUS, allergen, and the use of sustainable uh, bioenergy. So here on this slide, uh, you see a couple of examples, such as advanced uh, battery designs that can provide a step change in uh, energy density and open the possibility to electrify heavy duty trucks or short uh, distance ships and even uh, possibly uh, short flights, something that we have heard also from, from the industry sector. However, uh, we need to keep in mind that uh, all these technologies are still at the prototype stage uh, today. Uh, another important area where uh, we need uh, an, an important scale up is the case of CCUS. Uh, we will need to uh, successfully demonstrate CCUS in uh, the cement industry in particular to address process emissions. Similarly, carbon removal technologies such as direct air capture and biology with CCS will be needed to offset residual emissions and help to advance the date of net zero emissions. They will also help to produce synthetic fuels for aviation. Uh, as we cannot rely only on electricity for sectors such as uh, the aviation sectors. And uh, as you can see also uh, uh, on the slide, uh, we have the world allergen and scaling up electrolyzers for allergen uh, production is really an another important area where progress uh, is needed. So for governments, there are really two aspects on, ev on innovations that are fundamentally important. First, an increased impetus to innovation is needed uh, to make sure that we reprioritize spending in clean energy R&D, making sure that we have the right investment uh, to scale up demonstration projects. And second, we need to bring international cooperation to a new height, accelerating innovation, developing international standards, and coordinating to scale up technologies needs to be done in a way that links national markets. So our, our analysis shows that it will take several decades longer to reach net zero emission without such international cooperation. So with all of that, I'll pass you the floor again, uh, Dr. Kuhl. So, question. Now, thank you very much, Dr. Bukhar. And um, after all these uh, conceptual um, type of insights into um, what it actually would uh, require um, to get to net zero emissions um, by the year 2050, let me remind you um, somehow echoing what uh, we Seng said in the beginning of this presentation about the fact that even though the transformation of the energy sector is, of course, motivated by the fight against uh, climate change, um, that doesn't mean that all of the benefits will just be environmental and environmental here also being um, air pollution benefits in emerging econ economies. There are also huge commercial 
industrial and employment gains for those that make the leap to a new global energy economy. To give you just a sense of the opportunity, if the world uh, gets on track for net zero emissions by um, the year 2050, then the cumulative market opportunity for manufacturers of new technologies, emerging technologies, from wind turbines to solar panels, from solar panels to lithium ion batteries, electrolyzers, fuel cells, etc. The market opportunity amounts to roughly 27 trillion um, dollars, um, uh, which is um, roughly in just these five equipment markets, roughly uh, comparable to the size of today's uh, oil market by uh, mid-century, creating, of course, enormous prospects for companies uh, as well as investors that are well positioned along a growing set of uh, global um, supply chains. Now, where are we, though, in um, terms of um, the investments? Um, those of you who are following us will know that for many years, the IA has warned about a potential mismatch between the investment in oil and gas supply, on the one hand, and in investments in clean energy technologies um, on uh, the other hand. In the case of um, oil and gas, what we are seeing, in fact, right now is that upstream investment is half of what it was in uh, 2014, while oil and gas demand, even with the effects of um, the pandemic, has not changed to anything like the same extent. Uh, the industry is, of course, uh, able to do more with less. Today, um, upstream operations are much leaner, more efficient, um, but still this new normal that we now observe for oil and gas investment appears to be somewhat more geared towards a future in which the consumption of oil and gas is stagnant or even in decline. In practice, spending on oil and gas production since 2020 is broadly aligned with um, the near-term amounts that are projected in a near uh, in a net zero by 2050 pathway in which we don't the in which in this pathway this net zero by 2050 pathway we on the back of um, policies to bring down a fossil fuel demand we would not see new fields approved after 2021 and uh, on the back of a sharp reduction in fossil fuel demand now investment in clean energy um, technologies uh, and related infrastructure, uh, however, let me just see if the click works. Yeah. Uh, investment in clean energy technologies and related infrastructure um, was much more resilient in 2020, and we expect there to be an uptick even this year in 2021. But while this investment in fossil fuels and oil and gas is broadly aligned with that of a net zero by 2050 scenario, we cannot say the same for today's investment in energy transitions, which actually needs to more than triple to the year 2030. If you don't have that boost in investment in clean energy and infrastructure, so the investment on the right-hand side of um, this slide, um, then you can't have the left-hand oil and gas figure while still maintaining reliable energy supplies. What we are seeing in energy markets today is not related to clean energy transitions or climate policies, but the mismatch that you are looking at on the screen here creates evident risks for the future. And the way out is obviously to boost investment in clean energy technologies across all technologies and across all markets. Now, what needs to be done? Um, what we have set out with our net zero emissions by 2050 pathway is an assessment of what is needed um, to get to uh, address um, the world's uh, most imminent challenge or the most uh, important challenge, which is to get uh, to address uh, climate change. In our view, the path is narrow, but still achievable, but it does require an unwavering uh, attention by governments around uh, the world and setting targets, as we have seen them at COP, um, to reach a net zero emissions over the coming decades is important. But what is even more important now is to set clear policies along the way in order to get to that um, long-term uh, targets. There will be many uh, different milestones that uh, will have to be achieved. Dr. Bukar 
already mentioned some of them for technology innovation, for technology deployment, and of course, um, policy uh, milestones. Um, we have set out in our report more than 400 um, such milestones at a global uh, level that are actually outcomes of um, the analysis. Um, of course, every country has its very own uh, circumstance and will make its very own uh, plans for the transition to net zero emissions, depending on its own priorities, but also depending on um, its point of departure, the pace of a clean energy transition in our pathway is different and much faster in advanced economies than it is uh, in emerging uh, economies. Just to give you a sense of uh, the scale of the change that is needed, first of all, um, hydrogen here is set to become an increasingly important part of our energy mix towards net zero emissions by the year 2050. Already in 2030, low carbon hydrogen supplies need to scale up from next to none today to around 150 million tons by 2030 with a big, big jump in electrolyzers uh, installations. Second, uh, it is important to recognize that there is no shortage of technology options to decarbonize electricity generation. In our scenario, the sector is the first to achieve net zero emissions at a global level by 2040. But, and here comes my point about the difference between emerging and advanced economies, uh, advanced economies reach net zero power generation in our analysis already by the year 2035. Finally, um, uh, renewables um, are set in such a pathway to become the dominant source of electricity generation by 2050, almost 90% of um, uh, ele total electricity generation uh, are from renewables and almost 70% um, from solar PV and wind power alone. Let me conclude by saying that um, our pathway in the way we are seeing it is uh, a pathway to net zero emissions by the year 2050, not the pathway. We have in fact analyzed additional ones in our report um, to explore some of the key uncertainties. Many of them relate to technologies. CCS is one, carbon capture utilization and storage and it achieved the scales that we are projecting. Um, similarly, behavioral changes. Um, can uh, be, uh, um, people change their behaviors in the way we have been assuming it in our pathway? Or the question of sustainable bioenergy. How much of that is actually um, available um, for the energy sector in a path to net zero emissions? So there are many uncertainties, which is why we believe that um, it is important to recognize that it is a pathway and not the pathway, and also because every country has its own circumstance. But what we wanted to achieve with this report, and that comes back to what I said earlier, is to establish a common understanding of what reaching such a goal actually will mean in energy sector practice and inform and stimulate the debate on how our collective climate goals can be achieved in practice, regardless of where we are coming from. With that, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward together with my colleague Dr. Bukar um, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much Dr. Bukat and Dr. Gu. We are now entering the Q&A session. Uh, I can see that a number of you have already entered the questions. Allow me to start by asking one question that I have. One of the most headline grabbing statements coming out of the net zero emissions scenario from IEA is that there is no new oil, gas and thermal core development from now on in order to get to net zero. I think that statement really has sent short waves to many of the project developers, companies who are considering doing expansion of new or existing gas fuels and also to the financial community. As DBS has signed up to be the Net Zero Banking Alliance member, we know that there is now the touted $130 trillion to be allocated to sustainable purposes. Do you think that the no new development for oil and gas and for more coal is an achievable goal? considering that in many quarters, including in developed markets, gas is still considered a transition fuel? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, it's an excellent um, 
uh, question. So I think it is important to recognize um, first and foremost that the scenario um, builds on the idea that the whole world moves with unwavering government attention to reach net zero emissions by the year 2050. What does it mean? It does mean in practice that policies are put in place as of today to reach that goal. What we've been trying to say in the report and what I've been trying to say in this presentation as well is that demand side policies are the critical enabler of the message that there is no need for new um, oil and gas investment um, in uh, such a pathway. Having said that, I think it is imp also important to recognize that every fossil fuel uh, has a different fate in such a um, pathway. Uh, coal demand drops by more than 90 percent uh, in such a pathway to uh, net zero emissions by um, uh, 20, um, uh, 2050. Oil demand drops by roughly 75 percent in that scenario and gas demand only by 55 percent um, over the um, next uh, three decades. What does it um, mean in practice? It means, for example, that gas is a fuel that is still being used in particular in emerging economies um, over the next decade before it goes into a, um, a strong uh, phase down. So there are very different um, uh, fates to it. And I think the, focusing solely on the message that um, there is no need for fossil fuel uh, investment in such a pathway misses the important aspect that demand has to come down first as a result of government intervention. That's very true. I think um, a lot of the uh, commentaries on this really uh, touch on the point that we have been trying to reduce supply and we have been pressuring a lot of the producing countries and companies, but no one has informed the customers that they have to do the same. So definitely demand needs to meet the supply reduction. Um, let me now go to um, the questions that have been put into the pigeonhole. Um, there, is, there are actually two questions on carbon offset, so let me pick this one. Um, what role do carbon offsets have in a net zero world, especially for developing countries? Um, how much have you factor in the use of carbon offsets uh, and what type of carbon offsets uh, in order to get to net zero? Uh, it's a good question, and I think it's a very architectural question um, in um, many ways. I think it is important to recognize that there are two elements here. One is the transition itself, which offsets and can certainly help um, accelerate um, the transition um, towards uh, net zero emissions in individual countries, vis-a-vis -vis countries that may struggle in the beginning to achieve um, that pathway. But by the year 2050 in such a pathway, there is not, not much to offset anymore. Um, we are looking at a world where um, the vast majority of um, energy sectors is actually um, decarbonized. So we have not been relying on offsets in this scenario um, for the energy sector. And I think it is important to recognize also that this pathway did not rely on um, uh, the idea that uh, land use uh, changes can actually make up for a slower transition, potentially make up for a slower transition. Uh, the energy sector. This is not how the scenario was designed. The scenario deliberately avoids um, the idea that um, uh, other non-energy parts of um, the global economy may uh, actually have the potential for it. Okay, well that's actually um, injecting quite a note of optimism in understanding that the scenario actually does not expect the world to plant more trees, to protect more mangroves, um, in order to get to net zero. Um, can I ask a related question? How much does the scenario factor in the use of carbon capture and storage? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. First, let me uh, rectify this slightly, this last statement. Um, uh, of course, there is a need to, um, for nature-based um, solutions, but what we did not rely on is the idea that we can grow mango trees in order to um, uh, make a transition slower in the energy sector. So there is a need to address land use emissions, absolutely, and I think this also okay. re resonated very strongly from uh, COP26 um, the other day. Now, um, what uh, concerns uh, CCS, we do rely on CCS in this scenario. In fact, um, 
we're reaching already um, 1.7 gigatons uh, CO2 captured by the year 2030, and then uh, 7.6 uh, gigatons by the year um, uh, 2050. What is it used for is the important part, though. Um, there is an element um, uh, that is in, uh, important here, which is that uh, the contribution from power generation is actually fairly limited uh, in our projection. Because carbon capture utilization and storage um, does play a role, in particular in emerging economies where the coal fleet is still relatively um, uh, young. Um, but um, in the vast majority of the cases, as I said, 90% uh, of uh, electricity generation actually comes um, from renewables. So where does do we need CCUS? CCUS is actually important in heavy industries. There's virtually no other solution in the cement sector um, to get the sec to sector to um, carbonize fully. Plays an important role in uh, steel production, in the chemical industry where you need it for uh, for addressing emissions, for example, from uh, hydrogen. It also plays an important role for um, hydrogen production as one of the two pathways, the so-called blue hydrogen plays a role here. And lastly, we have um, negative emissions technologies, um, so-called carbon dioxide um, uh, removal technologies, that is bioenergy with CCS and is uh, direct air capture. The two of them uh, help to offset emissions in uh, hard to decarbonize sectors such as uh, aviation, um, shipping, where the pathway may be a bit more uh, challenging um, because of the availability of these. Um, technologies, 1.9 gigatons of the 7.6 that we're capturing by the year 2050 are actually negative emission technology. Great. Let me move on to the next question that's got the most votes. With national pledges being voluntary, I guess um, they refer to the nationally determined contributions to NDCs, uh, and with no enforcement mechanisms. Do you have any thoughts on the recent COP26 takeaway um, as to how how is this going to pan out? I think um, I think it is important to recognize that this is the way that the Paris Agreement has been designed. Um, the Paris Agreement is a bottom-up process in which countries submit what they actually um, uh, want to uh, achieve and um, ideally and uh, in most of the cases what is being done also how they want to achieve it of course there is no enforcement mechanism but there is a mechanism of ratcheting up ambition over time and uh, what we are seeing actually is a very good and laudable step is that um, towards cop 26 in egypt already uh, countries will be invited to um, to see how they can further ratchet up their ambition for the near term in order to achieve um, their long-term goals. And as I was trying to say at the outset, what is critically important here is this renewed sense of momentum in terms of international uh, cooperation um, that uh, we are seeing in order to address some of these critical areas and to help each other to establish actually plans to reach um, the uh, nationally determined uh, contributions and those voluntary pledges um, that have been made. So I think um, even though there is no enforcing mechanism as such, the mechanism that has been put in place um, with uh, regular stock taking is actually a very, very important, um, to my mind, um, uh, key step towards reaching the long-term goals. Okay, as we are nearing the end of the session, um, let me jump on to the next question. Um, with such a large ambition gap, so I think this refers to when Stephanie was talking about the wedges, um, and an underwhelming result from COP26, where you see coal given a second lease of life. Do you think that we can remain optimistic? Uh, will COP27 be another similar situation? So I think uh, you can maybe express your personal views rather than the IEA house view. Well, I'll start and maybe... Uh, <laughs> So I think it is important to recognize where we are coming from um, and uh, to be very clear here. Um, think about 10 years ago uh, where we used to be uh, in terms of the discussion or even um, rather 12 years ago um, with um, the Copenhagen uh, climate conference where I think the mood afterwards was extremely subdued uh, to, to put it uh, mildly. Uh, 
um, what we have achieved over the last decade or so in terms of uh, global processes uh, on the one hand, but also technology development for renewables, electric cars, and so on, is actually um, extremely positive. We have seen additional, also when it comes to coal, very positive developments about the announcement of China and several other countries to stop financing coal abroad. Um, there is a lot of momentum in um, the climate debate and uh, in uh, climate policy. I think the question is not if we will achieve a decarbonization um, of the energy sector, but the question is, will we achieve it on time? So I think uh, I would not um, be as uh, pessimistic as I uh, kind of sense it out of this um, question. I'm actually I'm still um, filled with optimism, um, not least given the technology progress that we're seeing in many parts of Right, that's great. So um, that's I the end of our current aim. Sorry, oh, I can have yes, on that, go ahead. Lars. No, I, I think uh, I agree with what uh, Dr. Gould has said that uh, we can remain optimistic, and personally, I am uh, also looking at back at um, as Dr. Gould said ten years ago, we were uh, in a very different situations, not only on the announcements but also on the actors involved in the energy transition. Uh, today, it's not only about governments, but we have also local communities. We are seeing pledges announced by the industries. Uh, so I mentioned the, com the number of countries that have now said that they will stop IC sales, but this is the case also for industries that now plan to stop selling uh, IC cars in, in the future. And sometimes the industry is moving faster than governments. So that's why also I think uh, we can we can remain uh, optimistic. Thank you. That's the end of our Q&A session. Thank you very much for being so frank and um, detailed in your answers. Uh, we think I'll now pass this back to you for closing remarks. Thank you, Yolanda. And uh, I trust that a lot of us have enjoyed it. I certainly did. Thank you, Timor and Stephanie. It was a very engaging and insightful session. I really enjoyed the Q&A. And maybe just to break it down for, for, for everyone, I, I really like what our speaker said that one of the report's outcome really is to create a common understanding so that increasingly we are on the same page. And then we can aim for the same meaningful goals. And then setting out where do we go from here the, in that sense, um, if we follow the, the different scenarios. And I was quite heartened actually to see that um, versus the steps scenario, which led us to 2.6, 2.7. The actual announced pledges scenario brings us to 2.1. So although it's not at 1.5, still not bad from 2.7 to 2.1. So that's, that's, that's really something that, uh, especially for a business person like me, fills me with optimism. Of course, the remaining, remaining gap in, uh, is the job to be done. And that again, actually fills me with optimism in terms of uh, the business opportunity and the ability to collaborate across. Uh, a couple of other takeaways would be that even in the steps scenario, it is almost peak coal. Uh, that's, that's in that sense the, the, the easiest scenario, if I can put it that way. And in the APS, the announced pledges scenario, oil peaks in five years time and gas peaks not long after that. And if you want to get a net zero, oil actually peaks now. And so that, that kind of sets up the, 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 where do we if where are we headed but what needs to be done was the third part that i thought was really well presented by uh, our colleagues from iea and it was broken up into 2030 and then to 2050 and then into 2030 um the quadrupling of solar wind and the 18 fold time increase in evs uh the good news is existing technologies are actually there and it's about getting there so at least for the next 10 years for this decade there's a lot to be done and the technologies are there. 2050, low common new technologies, uh, hydrogen-based fuel, advanced batteries, uh, a lot of collaboration. Again, a lot of the new technology is not there yet, but again, opportunity to create and co-create together. Uh, the last bit that kind of um, really struck it home for me was the oil and gas upstream investments are, are are really where they should be for a net zero broadly about 400 billion if i recall correctly but the as they 
come down to these levels, which is about half of 2014, uh, the clean energy investments that are supposed to take over are not really getting there. Uh, and we're about three, time, three times away. So that that is probably what we're seeing, not probably, it is what we're seeing uh, happening in energy markets right now, where the gas prices, et cetera, versus uh, the new clean energy investments that we need. And, and, and that, that excites me in terms of uh, how we as an industry think about what's next for us and determining suitable transition pathways and even strategies for our clients uh, in different industries, creating realistic medium-term milestones to 2030 to 2050 in the journey is really the job for us at DBS, especially in, in my energy group, is really the job for us uh, to do. And we really aim to work with you, our clients, leveraging our sustainable and transition finance framework to achieve meaningful decarb decarbonization strategies in the sectors that remain uh, resource intensive and fossil fuel intensive. A case in point I'm seeing, uh, and I, I believe I mentioned it previously before, low carbon hydrogen. We're seeing countries like Australia and Indonesia, traditional commodity countries that had their fair share of fossil fuels, are really pivoting to looking at using renewables from hydro to big uh, solar farms, given their big land footprint that they have, uh, to create um, green minerals. And we're, we're, we're talking to a few right now about how we do that. Another case in point, the supply of carbon credits is expected to be tight, especially with COP26. And we need more forests uh, to, to, to protect them and also to grow them. And we are, my project finance team is actually looking at possibly uh, financing some of these new uh, forest growths, if, if you will. And that, that's really an exciting new area for us, but it really shows that uh, a lot of work to be done. It's good to have a lot of work to do. And we really want to partner each and every one of you uh, in this race to net zero. Um, I hope you have gained deeper insights into what lies ahead uh, in terms of what you need to think about for your individual businesses and where it should go and where you should put your money. And we really will be happy to have deeper conversations with you together to see how you can fund that plan uh, that you're thinking about. So last but not least, give us your feedback through our post event survey. And we really look forward to hosting you once again in our next DBS Business Insights series. Thank you and stay safe.